The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. All right, but I mean, the first question is already so wide, so we pretty much have to go through all the slides to, <laughs> to <answer. laughs> Because that's pretty much what the slides are about, right? So I guess we'll just plow through the slides then. All right, so this is kind of the history of, is this crooked? It is, right? Is it supposed to be like this? It isn't normal like that. No. It looks like it's got a piece of the side. Yeah, where do you change that? Is it, it's sitting on its cord. Oh, it's sitting on its cord. No, it didn't. You make it sit on its cord. No. <laughs> yeah, it is actually. <laughs> Let's leave it like this. But it's weird, okay, well. It seems like it's adjusting wrongly. Maybe it's because it's black. Right. I'll just, I mean, you can read it anyway. So basically, this is ju just a history of, of MySQL and, well, and Maria. So MySQL was created in 83. Well, initially in 83, it was not, not, nothing close to what MySQL is today. Back in 83, it was a one-man project. He was using it for his... Uh, uh, his customers, he was working in a, a, in a software consulting company. So they were using this database instead of paying Oracle or, or something else. They were using this. And then in the beginning of the 90s, it was developed on a platform. I can't even remember which platform do you remember. They discontinued the platform. So he was like, well, OK, what do I do, not, do now? I have to recode the whole thing because the platform it existed on didn't, didn't uh, well, was going to be discontinued. So he had to redevelop the whole, uh, it was called Unireg at the time, but it was uh, what would eventually be my, MySQL. So he recoded it and his good friend, uh, David Axmark, convinced him to let's just recode it and release it as open source, right, as uh, open source. And well, they had some discussions and eventually said, okay, let's just release it as open source. They had like five customers or something, so he was scared, hey, the customers will, will use it for free. The guy was like, you have five customers. He was like, okay, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so they released that open source in, in uh, 95. And at the same time, they founded a company, MySQL, and they renamed it to MySQL. And it turned out to be a pretty good time because, because that's kind of the same time the internet kind of boomed. So the LAMP stack became a, a thing. If you had a website, you had a LAMP stack. So MySQL became ev uh, prominent everywhere where you had a website. So it was extremely good timing for MySQL to be founded in 95. And then the company slowly grew. And in 2001, uh, in January, they hired Martin Mikos to be the CEO. So before that, the founder, Monty, had been the CEO of the company. So it was very technically oriented uh, up to that time. They hired Martin, who was more business oriented. And the company started growing a lot faster. That's actually when I joined as well, 2001, but after Morton. So. And uh, then a lot of things happened. Uh, uh, I'm not going to go through all the details, but basically, uh, Sun acquired MySQL AB in 2008, or it was announced that Sun would acquire MySQL in January 2008. And then, well, towards the end of the year, Monty, the founder, he decided to leave the company, Sun, took a few developers with him, and their goal was to work for Sun on the MySQL project, but as an independent company, so that they wouldn't have all this you know, big company stuff to worry about, like processes and things like that. I mean, there are lots of good stories. Like, you go to a customer trip, and you are not allowed to get a GPS to your, computer, to your car, because it's, you know, the rules are you cannot have a GPS. So you can't have a GPS, and you're like, how can you get to the customers? And well, the rules are the rules, and they don't bend, right? So this kind of stuff, right? So that's why they left. So they created their own company called Monty Program, and they were working for Sun. But then in April 2009, Oracle 
announced that they would acquire Sun and thus MySQL as well. And Monty program pretty much immediately decided, okay, well, this changes the game completely. So let's, instead of working with Sun, let's create uh, a fork or a branch of MySQL. And that's pretty much why MariaDB was born. So they were already outside. They were already outside Sun when the acquisition happened, but they weren't supposed to create create a branch, but because of the Oracle acquisition, they decided to do it. And then in 2010, the first alpha uh, of MariaDB 5.1 was released, which was based on MySQL 5.1. And then uh, slowly but surely, Oracle started uh, uh, doing things like closing, closing. They, they added closed source modules in the 5.5 version of MySQL. So uh, like the thread pooling uh, and uh, PAM, uh, the authentication plugin, you can get those from MySQL. However, you have to pay Oracle to get them. So if you use the community edition of MySQL, you don't get the thread pool and you don't get an authentication plugin. You only get those if you pay for the, for the commercial version. And of course, MariaDB, the first thing they did was to recode the same features as open source. So MariaDB has those features, but as open source versions. And then Oracle started closing slowly the bugs databases. They don't release all, te all test cases anymore. And that angered uh, the distributions a lot because it kind of uh, goes against what the unit Linux distributions do. They want, they want to see all the test cases. If you have a bug fix, they want to know what bug is being fixed. If you have a security issue, they want to know what's being fixed, right? So they can verify it and test it. And by closing all that stuff, Oracle kind of, uh, well, the distributions weren't happy with, with the way the path MySQL was taking. And then in December, so last year, not very long ago, the MariaDB Foundation was announced, which is, of course, an independent entity, which is there to, to uh, ensure that MariaDB stays uh, alive, even if companies are acquired or whatnot. So the project stays alive, stays alive throughout acquisition. So pretty much so that the MySQL acquisition, Oracle acquiring MySQL can't happen again. That's pretty much why there's a MariaDB Foundation. And these things together are, are the reasons why the distributions started switching to Maria. So Fedora, they will be switching. The next version of Fedora will have MariaDB as the default database, right? And OpenSUSE has already switched. I think Slackware and Artware have switched already. And there's a few others as well. So a lot of distributions uh, are switching to Maria. Not only Maria as an option, but Maria as a default database. And it's kind of because Oracle is not really doing stuff the open source way. Pretty much the main reason why they're doing it. All right, so this is a bit of the background uh, history. Uh, I guess we should add the line here, of course, that SkyScale, the company I work for now, we merged with the uh, Monty program uh, in April. So the MariaDB developers, they now work for us. Well, or we work together. And SkyScale didn't have any engineering we were doing. Uh, services like support, uh, uh, consulting, and training, and they were doing engineering only, so it was a pretty good, pretty good fit. And we were had, we had a close partnership with, before them anyway, so it wasn't a huge, huge step. Um, but but MariaDB is not only tied to one company; it uh, 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 differently from MySQL. Even My, MySQL AB, even the, during the early days. I mean, the early days we got some outside contributions, but pretty soon. Uh, MySQL AB become, pr became pretty much the only controlling entity of MySQL. So everything that went into MySQL was coded by engineers at MySQL AB. And this is partly because of the licensing scheme, because we had uh, dual licensing. So MySQL was released during the, uh, under the GPL, but um, for people who embedded MySQL in their own software, we also sold a commercial license. So. If you, made a, you had an application that you distributed to your customers and MySQL was embedded and you did not want to be GPL yourself, you could buy a commercial license and then you could do it. And because of this, of course, we needed to own all the source code and we need to you know, indemnify them that there's no infringement and, and things like that in the source code. So contributing wasn't easy to MySQL AB. And 
MariaDB is actually, it's a lot easier to contribute to MariaDB than it ever was at MySQL because A, MariaDB will still stay GPL, MariaDB doesn't have a choice. I mean, we want it to stay GPL, but we don't have a choice because we're basing it on GPL code, so we have to stay GPL, which means that we don't have to worry about all this commercial, uh, uh, commercial uh, license stuff. So we can take contributions. And of course, everything is, is, is publicly available on Launchpad and so forth. Uh, so this is all statistics, but, but if you look at the, uh, the MariaDB captains, so the people who can, who can commit code to the MariaDB project, so 54 were inside the Monte program company, which is now part of SkyScale, and 46 were outsiders. So a fairly large part of, of the contributions comes from outside the company, which is good because it means that, uh, well, the MariaDB, it's not tied to one company, and it's not tied to the innovations of just a small set of people, but pretty much anyone outside. If they innovate and make something useful for MariaDB, they submit it, it will get accepted. So we have comp a lot of, there's a lot of companies that develop stuff around MySQL, like Facebook, Google, uh, Taobao, the Chinese company, and, and many others, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn. They all have engineers who actually develop patches and things to, to MySQL or MariaDB. And instead of all of them having their own patches somewhere living, they can all contribute this to MariaDB. And of course, it will, has to be tested and it has to be QA'd and all that stuff, but it will get into MariaDB, which is a pretty cool thing. And that's something that you cannot do if you, if you run it the way MySQL AB used to be or Oracle is now, because you, can't, you, you just can't take these contributions. So that's cool. Any questions about this? To, I mean, this is just this is the intro, and after this, I'll just go into the features. I know it's Sunday morning. I feel I feel the same. I feel the same. <laughs> right. All right. Let's continue. So I'm going to go straight into the features now. Uh, uh, basically, what I have here is the, f uh, the features in my in MariaDB that are not in MySQL. But this is not 100% true because. Uh, uh, I've done this in a, in a uh, kind of chronological order, so with the different MariaDB versions. And some of the features that were in MariaDB before are now in MySQL 5.6. So pretty much none of these features were in MySQL 5.5, but some of them are in MySQL 5.6, even though they were earlier in MariaDB. So, so the comparison is not exactly the comparisons work for, for the versions as we go through them, but, but they don't work with 5.6 anymore. OK. Um, I know it's a bit confusing, but it, unfortunately, that's the way it is. Because uh, some of these features uh, stem back from, from development projects already in, ongoing in MySQL before the acquisitions. So some of the features developed by Maria and MySQL actually have the same basis, because they were already half developed before. And then others don't. So there's a mix of different uh, features. Some features, some features developed by Maria were just so good, so Oracle had to develop the same. But because of the issues discussed before, they can't just take the features developed by Maria. They have to re-engineer them. So they, they get the feature. Oh, this is great. OK, let's do the same thing. And then they're like, OK, we can't look at the code because you know, it has to be our own. So let's develop this feature. Oh, no, it's too close. OK, they have to redevelop. You know, I, don't, I don't know how it works. But you know, they, obviously, they can't develop the same. And I don't know if they don't look at the code or if they have to make sure it's not too close or what they do, but, but they have a lot of issues with that because of the licensing and stuff. Right. So MariaDB 5.1 was released in February 2010, uh, the GA. Uh, one of the things MariaDB has had back in, back in the day and still has is a lot more storage engines than, than Oracle especially community uh, projects. So, so these are, are mainly dead, like PBXT doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but Federated X is, a, is an improved version of Federated. Uh, there's ExtraDB, which at the time was uh, fairly largely superior to, to InnoDB. Does anyone here know what ExtraDB is? All right, one guy. So you know InnoDB? It's the main transactional storage engine in MySQL. And uh, uh, obviously, it's open source, like everything else in MySQL, it's GPL. And uh, 
back in 2008, I think. Um, InnoDB was designed a long time ago, you know, in the 90s. So it was, so it was not particularly well optimized for multi-core environments because, well, they didn't exist back then. So, like around 2005, 6, uh, people started noticing, especially hardcore users, started noticing that, well, it didn't scale very well when you had multi-core environments. And in particular, Google, they. Uh, uh, they did a lot of work on this, they had issues, they couldn't scale it as well as they did, so they actually released some patches that made InnoDB scale better on multi-core core environments. And MySQL AB had the issue with the patches, so Google released them. MySQL AB was, uh, okay, we can't put them into 5.1, uh, we don't know if we can put them into 5.5, uh, but th thank you for your contribution, <laughs> right? So. So what happened was that ExtraDB was released. So ExtraDB in, initially was InnoDB with the Google patches. That was the start of ExtraDB. And then they added more stuff to ExtraDB. But initially it was just the Google patches on InnoDB. So that's kind of how ExtraDB came to be. Because MySQL AB was un, uncapable of doing anything with the Google patches. And ExtraDB was for a long period of time. It was superior to InnoDB, especially multi-core. Core environments. At, at MariaDB, we now think that with, in, with MySQL 5.6, they're pretty much on par, ExtraDB and InnoDB. So there's no big difference anymore. There's like some features available in one and some in the other, but on the grand scheme of things, they're pretty much equal. So the current plan for MariaDB 10, which is the next version, is that InnoDB will be the default engine and not ExtraDB. On, on MariaDB up to 10, ExtraDB has been a default engine because it's, it's better. When you say storage engine, um, pardon my ignorance, but I don't quite understand what aspect of the software you're talking about. The way it stores memory. No, on this. So if you really, really simplify how the MySQL server works, you can say it's like three pieces. It's the parser, optimizer, and storage engine. Okay. So the parser parses the SQL, the optimizer finds the optimal execution plan. And the storage engine is the one who decides how the data is stored, and thus also how it's, how it's ret it retrieved. So everything that has to do with indexes, storage, buff I mean, data buffers, and things like that, that's the storage engine. <coughs> and in, in MySQL, the default is InnoDB, which is a transactional engine. But there are others, like MyISAM is the traditional one, which is pretty much flat files with an index, I mean, text files with an index file that to, so you can access it and things like that. But InnoDB is the more like a normal database engine. But you can choose on each table, you can choose uh, which storage engine to use. So it's fairly flexible. Right. Um, some other features in MySQL 5.1, uh, MariaDB 5.1. There was an initial microsecond support, which didn't exist in, in MySQL at the time. It now exists in MySQL, and I believe they're now going to use the one from MySQL, right, in MariaDB. Yeah, I think they're taking the one from MySQL because it's the same feature. They had, in 5.1, they had a, a thread pool. Um, so a long, time, a long time before MySQL had a thread pool, there was one in MariaDB. MySQL in 5.5 released their uh, commercial extension thread pool, which turned out to be better than the one in Maria. So the Maria guys had to recode the thread pool because they couldn't be worse than MySQL. So they recoded it, and, and then Maria has one that's now better than it used to be in 5.1. I, that's actually a good example of the fact that having these different entities actually creates better products, right? Because they recoded there because it was better. Um, like, is there an echo? Can you, can you hear what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It sounds to me, it sounds like I'm in a church or something. But. <laughs> what does the microsecond support give you? So, uh, in MySQL, uh, you, the, granular, the granularity of, of, of queries and, and things were on second. You didn't have anything below second. And so this goes to microsecond level. Uh, so, for example, the process list only had the query execution time in seconds. And here you get it in microseconds instead. And same with the slow log. You couldn't, uh, the slow query log, you could only just choose, okay, how many seconds. So the slow, slow query log is where you log queries that are slower than a, than a certain time. And the minimum was one second. You couldn't go below it. So for a website where you have 
10,000 queries per second, it's pointless. I mean, every, anything that takes longer than a second is way too slow already. You want to find, have like a better granularity than that. That's what it's really used for. Um, then, um, so when, when Monty program was, was created, um, Monty, the, the initial uh, creator of MySQL, took with him uh, pretty much whoever of the old guard who wanted to come uh, with him. And incidentally, three of the four guys of the optimizer team wanted to follow Monty. So MySQL had, four, uh, had an optimizer team of four, three joined Monty program. The other guy <laughs> looked around and he was like, uh, okay, and two months later he also joined Monty, Monty program. <laughs> <laughs> So basically, the whole optimizer team joined, joined the MariaDB team, uh, which meant that, well, they could do a lot of optimizer features because they, have, they had all the guys at the optimizer team. And you will see that MariaDB has a lot of optimizer features, and that's basically because it, the whole optimizer team joined. It's also partly because they had already started working on some of the features before they joined, so they just continued to work on them at MariaDB. One of the features, one of the first features the optimizer team did was this table elimination feature, uh, which is a very, I mean, it's a very s small feature. It, it's only, it, use case is just very particular cases. So if you have uh, an anchor scheme, uh, schema kind of uh, setup. So basically this means that you have, uh, instead of having one large table where you store all, all the attributes, uh, you have kind of one, at, one table per attribute. And this, is, this might be because not all your entities will have all the attributes. So instead of having a huge table with lots of empty, empty space, you have specific tables for each attribute. And this also means that it's easy to add and remove attributes, right? So you can have, it makes it flexible. You don't have to do an alter table if you want to add an attribute. You just add a new table and add, attribute, add this attribute for wherever it makes sense. So it gives you a very flexible schema by having an anchor schema. Uh, the problem is that, uh, well, because you have lots of tables, it means lots of joins. And typically what happens is that you would create a view which makes it look like a big table, right? Because when you, where you join all of these tables. So you can then, if you do your queries from this view, instead of, instead of you writing all these uh, 20, 20 joins e each time. And the problem with MySQL was that uh, if you do this, MySQL cannot optimize this, this join. It will always join all the tables. So if you have 30 attributes, it will do a 30 table join always, even if you're just looking for one of these attributes. And that's basically what the table elimination feature does, is that it actually only joins the tables necessary in this, in this query. So, I mean, you would say it's a use case that no one uses, no one creates this, but it's actually not true. And especially if you, if you use some kind of middle layer that creates your SQL queries, they often do this type of schema to be more flexible because, uh, because then in the middle layer you can add attributes and stuff. And the middle layer does not, does not do alter tables, they just add, add tables in, in, a, in an anchor schema. So especially if you use middle layers, this feature is actually very useful. And it makes your queries faster, faster out of the box. You, install, you, have, you have this, you have, my, you have MySQL. You stop MySQL, you install Maria, start it, and same query will be faster because you don't have to change anything. It's not a feature you turn on and off, it's there, it works out of the box. So that was, Mar that was MariaDB 5.1. It was the first release of MariaDB. The main idea for, the Mar for that release was to just get it out, right? Get a first release, get MariaDB going, get the brand going. Then for 5.2, which is still based on MariaDB 5.1, which is based on MySQL 5.1, they added some additional features like the pluggable authentication, which was one of the commercial extensions by Oracle, which MariaDB recorded as, uh, as open source. And uh, this actually is something that's requested quite a lot by, by our customers because many customers want to, they have an LDAP system with authentication and they want to use that to authenticate MySQL. And through the PAM plugin, you can use your LDAP authentication. So you don't have to create new users and things like that in MySQL. You can just plug your LDAP to the PAM. Another really cool feature which was uh, created by either Google or Facebook. I'm not sure which one. It's Mark Callahan's team, but I can't remember if, it was, if he was at Google or Facebook when this was created. Do you know, Daniel? I can't remember. 
Yeah. So it's either Facebook or Google. It's this user statistics table. So in MySQL, you have, an inf you have the information schema uh, where you have lots of statistics on things. But all uh, 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 variables, like uh, statistic variables, are per server, right? So you see, you see how many full index scans you have for the whole server. For them, I mean, since you either restarted the statistics or since the server restarted. And same thing with everything else. It's always per server, per server, per server, which is good for certain things, but not so good for other things. Uh, for example, if you want to know if an index is used or not, that doesn't help you at all. If you want to know how many full scans you've done on a specific table, that doesn't help you at all, right? So what they added was statistics per, per user, per index, and per table. So when you turn this feature on, you can actually see, get very detailed statistics on each table, each index, and so forth. So that's a very useful feature for DBAs. Like we had a customer who has, uh, it's a very large customer. Uh, they have a small team of uh, DBAs, maybe 10 DBAs. And you know, they let their developers pretty much add, create tables and, and do whatever in the database. So uh, I was there and I was asking them, so do you have like a, do you have a documentation about the database? You know, what tables do what and, and, and so forth. They were like, um, no. I was like, okay, so how do you know? <laughs> they were like, well, you know, with time you learn. I was like, okay, wonderful. So I was like, okay, but what a, how do you know if a table, someone just creates a table and it's just lying there forever? The guys were like, well, actually, we don't. So I was like, so you, what do you do? He said, well, if a table looks like it's not being used, and that's his wording, looks like it's not being used, <laughs> uh, what we do is we rename the table, and if no one complains in a week, we drop it. <laughs> <laughs> right. I was like, OK. So I was like, maybe you guys should use these, these <laughs> tables, because then you would know if a table is used or not. Right. So if you have these statistics, you don't have that issue because then you can see, okay, this table has never been used or, or something. Right. So this feature developed by Google or Facebook, you can find it in you can actually find it in Percona server as well. It's one of the features that are available in both. But it's very useful. Very useful feature. Right. Uh, some other features, uh, a very cool feature in MariaDB is virtual columns. Uh, uh, which means that you can you can create uh, a column that's the the content is automatically generated based on functions on the other columns, right? Um, I mean the use case for this is in particular if you have uh, persistent columns and you create an index on the columns. So you can create an index on this column. So if you want to index something but not the actual value in in the in, the, in your um, in your column, but, but some kind of function of the value. You don't, you don't have to actually use that function in the database. You can add a virtual column, which automatically generates this functional value, and then you index that. Uh, like a typical example is, 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 uh, is uh, uh, web uh, uh, server name or web, web names like www. or whatever. Uh, cloud.skyscale.com, right? If you store the server names in this fashion, you cannot use an index to, to find them because you, can, you cannot do proximity searches because it goes, from, it goes from the most specific to the least specific, right? So if you want to find all skyscale.com servers, you would do star.skyscale.com and you cannot use an index for that. In order to use an index, you have to reverse the, the, you have to reverse the, the name. And that's what we used to always tell our customers. You have to reverse the name. You have to store the, 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 name, ver, uh, the name reversed. But now you don't actually have to store it reversed. You only have to create a virtual function which reverses it and then create the index on that virtual function. So you can still store the name in the right format and then use this virtual column. So virtual columns are, are useful. The only problem with virtual columns is, is that you do store the data twice. You store it in the original column and then as a result of the function. So it's not a true functional index, because you have to do it in two steps. You have to do a virtual column and then an index. But it's very close to being a virtual index. And MySQL, standard MySQL, does not have anything like this. Um, does anyone know what Sphinx is? Except Daniel. Yeah, it's a text search uh, engine. 
Uh, MySQL has some, some full text searching features, uh, but they're not very good. So, so if you do some simple full text searching, you can use MySQL. If you want to do some serious text searching, then you pretty much have to do, use some, some external products, Sphinx being one and Lucene is, is another one. And Sphinx uh, allows you to, to integrate your results with MySQL fairly closely. So I have a Sphinx, you have a Sphinx server running, uh, and in MariaDB you can connect through a Sphinx server through, my, through MySQL. So you can actually query Sphinx and your MySQL tables in one query, which typically what you would have to do is from the application layer first query Sphinx, find the primary key, and then query MySQL. But in MariaDB you can actually do it in one query. So you query Sphinx, get the, get the primary key, and then you query in the same query, you get the results from the table, actual table as well. So if you're using Sphinx, this is a cool feature. Uh, then there's one thing called a segmented my ISAM key cache. Who uses my ISAM? Who uses it in a DB? Who knows what I'm talking about? <laughs> okay. okay, so that's the storage engine thing I was talking about. So in a DB is the transactional storage engine. Uh, and my ISAM is kind of the traditional one, the flat file with indexes. And I talked about XDB that one of the reasons why XDB uh, came to existence was the fact that InnoDB did not uh, do well in a, a multi-core environment. And one of, the f one, one of the reasons for that, there were many, but one of the, things, the reasons for that was the, they have a buffer pool where they buffer data pages, and uh, that becomes a... Uh, uh, I mean, it, it becomes a bottleneck. Getting access to the buffer pool becomes a bottleneck because it f was controlled by one, uh, uh, well, one piece of code, right? So you had to, all, everyone had to go through it. So basically, the access to the buffer pool pretty much became sequential instead of parallel. So one of the things that InnoDB did was to uh, split this buffer pool up into multiple buffer pools. And MyASM had the same problem. MyASM had, has one. Uh, uh, cache called key cache, which is where all the index data is. And basically, in a multi core environment, you have the same issue. If you only have one key cache, you cannot concurrently access, access this. So, what they did in MariaDB is to split up the, my, the MySM key cache into different segments, which is called a segmented MySM key cache. And here's uh, the statistic. Actually, Daniel, is, was anyone at Daniel's talk yesterday? No. Daniel, Daniel had a talk about MariaDB 10 yesterday. You went, two, two of you went, three of you went. So he actually showed the same graph, Daniel. This is the, the benefit you get from the segmented key cache. So, uh, so, I mean, basically, when you have more concurrent threads, that's when you see a difference. If you don't have concurrent threads, it doesn't matter. Uh, so the blue line here is without the, key ca without the segmented key cache, you only have one key cache, right? So pretty much when you run it, already when you have four threads, you start running into concurrency issues. You cannot uh, linearly scale anymore because of the key cache, the key cache access. And then, of course, it just, it just fades out. It doesn't, by adding threads, you don't gain any benefit anymore. However, with a segmented, segmented key cache, it goes a bit further. I mean, the difference is about 20,000 to 5,000 queries per second is the difference in this. But of course, this feature is only useful if you use my eyes on. Uh, uh, InnoDB and ExtraDB have the same feature as well, and they are available in all, all server versions. Then the next thing is MariaDB 5.3, and here they added a lot of features which are more, uh, well, a lot of good features actually. Some are, are NoSQL type features and others are other features. So the first feature is a handler socket which allows you to access uh, the storage layer directly. So you pretty much bypass the parser when you do this. You can, through the handler socket interface, you can access the storage engine without doing SQL parsing. And, and no optimizer. And no optimizer. You can just do simple operations. So uh, create, replace, update, delete is all you can do. So it's not very useful, but again, in very specific use cases, like say you have a huge batch of small operations, it will probably be faster using the handler socket interface than doing it through SQL. So it's for batching or something like that where it, where it makes sense. Uh, another feature which is a lot cooler is dynamic columns. 
Uh, so basically, it allows you to create columns where, um, well, it allows you to have multiple attributes stored in one column from a, from a schema perspective. Uh, so again, think no SQL, think flexibility. So if you want to have a bit the same reasons why we have an anchor schema, we have lots of attributes, and depending on what rows we have, they will have some but not all of the attributes. So again, instead of creating a huge table where you have every single possible attribute that could potentially exist and most of them will be empty, uh, here you create a dynamic column which has all attributes that, that are not necessary for each row. So anything, pre for example, if you have a web store, uh, anything that describes the object would be in this column. Like you would have the primary key, the name, and the price or something might be in different columns, but everything else that describes the object, like color, you know, screen size, whatever, that really depends on what, what the object is, would be in this column. And here, you can completely dy dynamically add or remove columns each time you insert a row. So this is how it looks. Can you see this? So you create a table. Uh, you add a column. This is a medium blob. So you add a column, which is a blob column, so just a binary object. And then when you do operations with this column, you take these predefined functions like column create and, and so forth. And with the column create, you can add any number of attributes and give values for these attributes. OK? And before MySQL, uh, before MariaDB 10, uh, unfortunately, these attributes are numbered. There's no name. But starting with MariaDB 10, you can actually name them as well. Right. So here, for example, in this example, we have a, a attribute number one means color. So every object that has a color, we will give a value to attribute one. If there's an object that doesn't have a color, well, we won't give this attribute. And we have uh, one attribute here, number 10, is the shirt size. So obviously, the shirt will have a shirt size, but the mobile phone won't have any, any value for this. Right? So you completely dynamically decide which attributes each row will have. And it's stored in a blob. And then you can access this through these predefined functions. Uh, well, there's a column list which gives, which gives you which attributes this column has, and there's some other functions like column get, which looks for, which looks, look, looks for a specific attribute, and so forth. Uh, a question that's often asked is, well, so can you index these attributes? And the answer is no, you cannot because it's a blob. You cannot index a blob. However, what you can do is you can combine this dynamic column with a virtual column and index the virtual column. So you can have a virtual, for example, if you want to index uh, the color for some reason, you want to look at, I mean, it doesn't sound very plausible that you would want to have an index on the color, but let's say you want to have an index on the color of objects inside, inside this table. So you create a virtual column which does this. It gets the color value of every single object in this, in this dynamic column, and then you can index on this. And there you have an index to look for the color. I mean, typically, color is not, might not be what you want to index, but you might want to index something else. But, but you can do it through the virtual column. So that's pretty cool. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not exactly JSON, but it's, but it's kind of close to JSON. And it's actually, uh, actually one of our guys who's developing scripts for converting this back and forth through, uh, from JSON format. There's actually, there's, there's features for getting this out in JSON format, I think. In MariaDB 10, you can actually, uh, anything you have in a dynamic column, you can actually get it out in JSON format. There's no feature for getting, reading JSON format natively yet. But there are scripts where you can, trans, uh, where you can uh, convert JSON <laughs> format into this dynamic column uh, format. So that's a pretty cool feature. Does anyone like this feature? OK. I got two likes and one maybe. That's, that's quite good. I like this feature. All right. Um, I guess the, the, the thing with this feature is, well, 
if you need to have, I mean, you don't have to go to NoSQL just because you need flexibility because you can get it within MariaDB. Of course, there are other reasons for going to NoSQL uh, solutions, but you don't need to go for no, to NoSQL for this. Uh, right. Some other features in my, uh, MariaDB 5.3. Uh, some replication enhancements, uh, checksums for bin log events and things like that. I guess uh, for DBAs, a really nice features, feature is this. So uh, MySQL, the MySQL bin log has two formats, right? I, it ha you can store, store your statements in statement-based format or in, in row-based format. And uh, the bin, that's what's in the bin log is used for, for replication and also for incremental backups. Because when you take a backup of MySQL, you synchronize with the bin log so that you can replay everything that happened in the bin log after your backup. So it's kind of an incremental backup, the bin log. And traditionally, you store statements. So if you write an insert, you store this insert in the binary log. The problem with storing statements is that some functions are non-deterministic. So if you, store, if you store a statement containing a non-deterministic function, it means that the result of this statement depends on something else. So it means that if you run this statement twice, you might not get exactly the same result, which means that basically your database will look different if you run this a second time. And this is why we introduced row-based uh, row uh, events or row-based binary logging in my, uh, MySQL 5.1, which means that instead of storing a statement, you store row images. So this is how the row looked before the operation. This is how the row should look after the operation. So we don't care which statement caused this operation. We just store how the row should look, which makes it a much completely deterministic. We don't care which function there was. We don't care what it did. This is how it should look. And this is great, uh, except I mean, there were bugs in the beginning, which is a bit scary. But once, it, once they fixed most of the bugs, I mean, this was 5.1, so a long time ago. Uh, but one of, one of the main complaints we got from uh, uh, some DPAs were like, all right, this is great. But now I have a, one of my developers who said, who said that, oh, I deleted some rows by mistake. Could you please undo that statement? Well, if you have, uh, if you have your binary log in, in row-based format, you can't find the statement in the binary log anymore because the statement is no longer there. So we actually had one company who said that we refuse to change the row-based format because of this, because we have developers deleting stuff all the time, and we want to be able to find the statement <laughs> from the binary log. So what MariaDB did was that they actually added the statement. So there's, a, uh, there's an option for, sto for storing your binary log in, in row-based format, but with the statement on top in a comment. So if you apply this log, the statement won't be used for anything, but it's there so that you can search for it uh, as a DBA. So it's a cool feature for DBAs. Although solving social problems with technical features <laughs> never works. I know. It's funny, you know, the stuff you hear from customers. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a, it's such a simple feature, but, but apparently it was very important. This is why it's good to, to communicate with your customers, because you, know, you never know what. You think, you're, you, think what, you think what they should be doing, but they're not doing what you think they, they are or should be. Another feature, which was actually uh, requested by a customer as well, is a progress report for alt alter tables. So, you know MySQL. Alter table sucks, right? Until 5.6. Uh, I mean, all alter tables in, in MySQL, it's like, okay, hold on, alter table, let's assume that he's doing something bad and let's create a copy of the table. And we lock the table, we create a new table, we copy everything from the, from the old table to the new table, and then we release the locks and, and so forth. So even if you do an alter table, you change a column name. MySQL recopies every single row in the table to a new table, which is completely useless, but that's the way it's done, right? Which means that alter tables are horribly, horribly slow in MySQL. So, I mean, that's probably number one. We're not fixing this, but what we're fixing is that actually now you know how slow they're going to be. So if you do an alter table, if you do an alter table, you actually see a progress report. So if you do it from the MariaDB client, you get like a, a, a row below it saying, all right, this is how long it's, this is how much, how big a percentage of this stage we've done. And typically, your DBA, you start an alter table, and then you sit there and you wait, you wait, 
And then it's been like 10 minutes, you're like, okay, I have to cancel this. It's been 10 minutes, my table is offline. But you're like, but what if it only takes 11? You know, you're so close. So you'd let it go for a bit further. And then 20 minutes later, it's like, it's been half an hour. My table is not used. It's like, but if it's a 35 minute altered table, I was this close, you know? <laughs> but it, so it's like really hard to know when should you cancel it and when should you let it go? And, well, now you know, right? If you use this feature, you see, you, after five minutes, you see, okay, 10% is going to take 50. Or, or 90, it's going to take six, so you know exactly when to cancel it. So that's good. I mean, still, the alt table sh alter table's performance should be fixed, but that's a different problem. Uh, there's actually a, a feature request for fixing it, especially some of the simpler alter table operations that could be done really quickly, but uh, it's not there yet. Some of them in 5.6 in, in DB, some of them are online, but not all. Um, then there was a lot of optimizer enhancements as well in, in uh, MariaDB 5.3. Um, oh, we're running out of time, so I'm not going to go through all of the, these, but the main one was the sub-query optimization. So um, in um, My, MySQL 4.1, uh, we added sub-queries, right? Because people kept complaining. You don't even have subqueries. You don't even have subqueries. We can't use MySQL. It doesn't have subqueries. So in 4.1, we just, okay, we added subqueries. We have subqueries, checkbox, checkbox marked. People are, oh, great, you have subqueries. Should we use them? It's like, God, no, don't use them. Because the performance is abysmal, right? Because like a lot of other things, the subquery performance was like, all right, let's expect the worst case, and let's just do the worst case. And that's it. So every time you had a subquery, we did it based on the worst possible combination of things. So we would always re reissue each, inter in each internal query for each row in the outer query and things like that, even if we didn't need to, just because you know, there was no optimization. So we used to have performance tuning gigs at customers. First thing we did was uh, using subqueries. Yes, OK, let's rewrite all of them to joins. Right. But now with MariaDB, they're actually rewritten by the optimizer, so you don't have to rewrite them yourself. You can actually use subqueries now. Again, it's a feature that people who have been using MySQL for a long time, they know this, so they don't use subqueries. But people who are new to MySQL, they don't know this, so they use subqueries and expect them to actually perform. And they, well, they didn't, but in MariaDB they do. And to be fair, uh, uh, MySQL 5.6 also has some subquery op optimization. So in MySQL 5.6, they're also uh, optimized. Uh, they don't have all of the optimizations, but and I haven't seen a benchmark comparing the two, but in, in theory, the optimizations that exist in both should be pretty much the same in performance-wise. But they don't have as extensive optimizations as MySQL, uh, as MariaDB yet. So that's a very cool feature. If you're using subqueries. And I'm going to skip the other ones. You can look at them later. Oh, yeah. A really cool feature is a group commit. Um, and group commit has to do with, uh, with disk I.O. So if, you're, if your traffic is I.O. bound, there's basically, in MySQL, there's basically two, two, two times you have to, um, two, two times you have to flush stuff to disk, right? So if you do a transaction, uh, this is in a DB, right? So, so you have, data files, the data pages, you have a buffer. Of course, if you do a transaction, you write everything in the buffer, right? You don't want to write anything to disk because disks are slow and, and disk seek time is even slower. Uh, you do changes, you do commit. Of course, if you commit your transaction, your changes should be persistent. They should be durable. That's part of being acid. Your changes have to be durable. Um, but what you don't want to do is flush your, your data pages to disk because they could be store, stored all over the place on the disk. So you would have to flush one page there, one page there, one page there. It would take a long time. So instead, you have what's called a, a redo log and a redo log buffer. So what you flush to disk is your redo log. Why? Well, because it's sequential. So you just write sequentially on disk because it's small. It doesn't have to change. You don't have to. Uh, you don't have to flush the whole data page, you just flush the changes you made to the data page. So every time the transaction is committed, you flush your read log, log buffer to disk. Okay. 
and this allows you to have this allows you to have uh, dirty pages in memory. So you have changes in memory in your data structure that has not been flushed to disk, because uh, if your server restarts, well, you have the changes here in the reader log, so you can actually apply the changes on this data, right? So you, that's that's enough. Uh, now, if you have a lot of a lot of concurrent transactions, this means that you might have a lot of transactions being committed here. So you might have a queue queue of transactions being committed. Uh, and if this is done, if it's, this is done sequentially, of course, it means that it becomes an, a, a bottleneck. So there's something called group commits. So if you have multiple transactions, they're committed together in one F sync to disk. And that's that's already existed in MySQL before. The problem is that you also have um, the binary log in MySQL, right? And the binary log has all your transactions, which means that when you commit a transaction, I mean, if you, if you care about the integrity of your data, when you commit a transaction, you not only have to flush the reader log buffer to disk, you also have to flush uh, the transaction to the binary log. And these have to be synced, because if your server crashes, you want your binary log and your data on your disk to be in sync, right? You don't want to have an event in the binary log that never took place here. For example, if you use this for replication, if you do an update here, you write it to the binary log but not here, then it means that the update will go to the slave, but it actually won't be on the master anymore because the master crashed and restarted, or the opposite. So you have to make sure that these are synced. And by default, it's not synced, actually. There's an option in MySQL called sync bin log, and you have to turn this on. Otherwise, the bin log and your reader logs are not necessarily in sync. And again, this, if you have a highly concurrent environment, becomes a bottleneck because you have all these transactions having to be synced to disk. And you might have a long queue here. So what group commit does is that it, uh, it commits all of these transactions that are in, in a queue waiting to be, to be flushed to disk. They flush them in one go. And that's basically all it does. It's a very simple feature, but it has huge impact on the future. And this is the first one, the one in 5.3, which was improved, or has been improved for 10.0, so it's even better for 10.0. And so Facebook had their own uh, group commit patch, which performed worse than uh, the one in MariaDB. They actually did a second one, which was somewhere here. And then they said, OK, we're never going to be as good as Maria. So they just took the one from Maria. So Facebook uses the group commit feature from MariaDB. They don't use MariaDB per se, but they took the group commit patch and patched it in their own, in their own server. So that's a very cool feature if you're IO bound. And again, it's a feature that's just there. You don't have to do anything. It would just kick in if you have, as soon as you have a, a, a queue for syncing your binary log, it will, it will kick in. Yeah? Is there some, what's the, what's the factors for that actually to increase your performance? Uh, I don't, it's some, it's some other, other bottleneck somewhere. I mean, I, I don't know why. It's, it depends on, and it depends, this is for a, a fast disk. If you look at results for the slower disks, they're much better. I mean, much better. I mean, the, of course, the slower disk will be slower, but they just keep increasing. So it's just that you hit something else here, some other bottleneck that's not the disk I.O. Right. OK, we're running out of time. So, um, so then from here, it'll be 5.5. Uh, so they added uh, the thread pool implementation. As I said, they, there was one for MariaDB 5.1, but because uh, Oracle made one for MySQL 5.5 that was better than the one in MariaDB 5.1, they redid it and have a new one that's uh, very good. So if you want the thread pool, you don't have to pay Oracle for, an, for a commercial version of MySQL. You can get it from MariaDB. There's atomic write with Fusion IO. Who uses Fusion IO here? No one? Who knows what Fusion IO is? OK. Ah, sure, oh, well, there you go. So that's a, a, I mean, if you, we have a lot of customers who use Fusion IO, actually, or SSDs in general, but Fusion, Fusion IO especially. So for them, this helps a lot, actually. I just spoke to a customer two weeks ago who said that they changed to Maria, and they actually saw an, imp saw an impact of this feature, atomic write feature in performance. And. Um, Another feature which is 
really silly, it's pretty much useless. It's a, it's a limit rows examined. So typically MySQL has a, has a limit something. So you do a select limit 10, which means you only get 10 rows in your select. However, if there's a huge join before, it will create the join result before giving you the 10, 10 rows. So now you can have a, have a limit rows examined which means that if you only examine this many rows in the join or whatever, and then it will stop and give you whatever result it has come to. So it's kind of, limit 10 works if you do a single table, it means you only look at 10 rows, but if you have a complex uh, query, it might take, still take a long time to generate those 10 rows. So by adding this, you know, it's a DBA feature, of course, you don't use this in production anywhere, hopefully, but uh, it's still a cool feature. All right, there's MariaDB Galera cluster, but I already mentioned it yesterday. Uh, Daniel already gave a talk about MariaDB 10, so I'm not gonna say much more about that. The only thing I'm gonna, again, say, Dan I mean, Daniel did mention this yesterday, is these per thread memory usage, which are really cool. Uh, they kind of feed into the, the user statistics and things that we talked about. So you, you know, one of the big issues with MySQL is that uh, you don't, when you put memory usage limits, they're all global, they're not per thread. You cannot say one thread can only use this much. You, uh, I mean, you cannot have a global, sorry. You cannot have a global, you just have a per thread uh, limit. So like a uh, temporary table, uh, you have a max size and temporary table used per thread. So you can say that to be, say, 16 megs. Uh, but you're, there's no total usage limit, limit, which means that one query can only use 16 megs, which is not a lot, but if you happen to have a thousand threads doing temporary tables at the same time, it becomes a lot. But there's no way you can balance that. So that's very annoying in MySQL. But you still can't do it, but with this per thread memory usage, you can actually see how much memory your threads are using. So you can, it makes it easier to tune these uh, variables. By looking at that, that's a cool feature. And there's a lot of cool features in 10, but I'm not gonna go through this. All right, any questions? No questions? All right, thank you very much. Yeah, go ahead. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Astris. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Astris, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astris-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any asterisk or switch fox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. 
At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud tag. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. 
It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication. From Wicked. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.